1959, just 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles, a little-known nuclear disaster began to unfold at an important Cold War facility. The Santa Susana Field Laboratory, created by the government's Atomic Energy Commission and operated by Rocketdyne, played a vital defense role by producing powerful rockets. 2,800 acre site was built in the hills above Simi Valley, a town of 8,000 just west of Los Angeles's San Fernando Valley. Besides rockets, it was home to several experimental nuclear reactors, which the Atomic Energy Commission hoped could be commercially viable. One of them used sodium instead of water as a coolant. It was known as the Sodium Reactor Experiment, or SRE. But the experiment would soon trigger a technological nightmare. This reactor was built in an era of nuclear cowboys. The Atomic Energy Commission came out of the Manhattan Project. There was a culture of secrecy. There was a sense of excitement about pushing the limit on these reactors. On July 26, 1959, technicians barely managed to manually shut down the sodium reactor when temperature and radiation readings quickly jumped. Then, after two hours of basic inspections, they made a baffling decision. They started up the reactor anyway. They operated the reactor for about two more weeks before the radiation levels and there were so many signs of trouble that it was thought it was time to stop and to get real serious about finding out what was going wrong. When they dropped a camera into the reactor core, they discovered that 13 of 43 radioactive fuel rods were damaged and partially melted. And because this was an experimental reactor, a thick concrete containment structure, such a familiar and vital part of more modern reactors, wasn't required. It's just built in an ordinary industrial building. And in fact, it was designed so that radioactive gases would be intentionally vented from the reactor to holding tanks and then out into the environment. Exactly how much radiation went into the atmosphere is still a matter of debate, because the monitoring equipment at the facility could only measure very minor levels of radiation. This was a much smaller reactor than the one at the site of the famous Three Mile Island accident in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1979. But because it didn't have a containment dome, the sodium reactor might have created a much bigger problem. The SRE was about one hundredth the size of Three Mile Island. And the containment structure at Three Mile Island, according to the official government reports, stayed intact and that only a small fraction of the radioactive inventory were officially estimated to get out of the Three Mile Island reactor. And so several researchers have estimated that the radiation release from the SRE could be as high as 240 times the radiation release from Three Mile Island. Five weeks after the accident, the Atomic Energy Commission issued a press release claiming that just a single fuel rod had been slightly damaged and no radiation had been released. The body of the release said there is no evidence of unsafe operating conditions. One third of the fuel had experienced melting. It was one of the worst accidents in nuclear history, and the AEC essentially lied about it. In 1961, the Atomic Energy Commission made this film, which documents the extent of the damage and cleanup process. It also explained exactly what went wrong inside this unique reactor, where molten or liquid sodium was used instead of water to remove heat from the swimming pool-sized reactor area. Sodium reactors were being developed because there was a concern there wasn't enough uranium to fuel all of the nuclear reactors being built at the time. Sodium reactors never deplete their original fuel supply. Water reactors are less efficient since they consume uranium and eventually need to be resupplied. But the benefits of liquid sodium came with a price. Sodium burns in the presence of air, explodes in the presence of water. So the reactors had tremendous danger associated with them. Because water couldn't be near the reactor, a chemical known as tetralin was used to cool the bearings in the pumps that circulated the sodium as it carried heat away from the fuel rods. Everything worked well until tetralin started leaking through cracks in the pump seals, 
and into the reactor. The neutron bombardment in, inside the reactor core caused it to turn from an organic chemical into an almost like a glue or a tar-like substance. As the tetralin approached the fuel rods, it partially blocked the bottom of some of the coolant channels. When coolant flow decreased, the heat by those fuel rods increased and eventually reached melting point. What happens when the fuel starts melting is the radioactive byproducts, which have been created from reactor operation, have to go somewhere. And so those radioactive byproducts go into the molten sodium, and some of those byproducts come out as a vapor, and in this case, went into the air. Some of the radioactive materials, like strontium, are actually absorbed by the body into the bones and teeth, so they remain in the body for a long period of time all the while releasing radioactivity that can harm cells and other parts of the body. Workers who cleaned up after the accident or worked at the facility once it was restarted were at home. The studies that were done of the workers by a team from the UCLA School of Public Health found that the workers who had the highest radiation exposures had tripled the death rates from cancer such as cancer of the lung, lymph, um, and blood systems. As similar workers at the site who had lower radiation exposures. The University of California at Los Angeles was also responsible for bringing the story to the public. After the Three Mile Island accident in 1979, some of Daniel Hirsch's students started wondering if anything like it had ever happened in Southern California. In UCLA's engineering library, they found documents and photographs of the melted fuel rods from the sodium reactor accident at the site run by Rocketdyne's Atomics International Division. And by a quirk of fate, it turned out that the man who had founded and run Atomics International had subsequently become dean of engineering at UCLA and taken with him box loads of the old documents. We then released that to the press in 1979. So the AEC kept it secret, and it stayed secret for 20 years. The Atomic Energy Commission also managed to conceal accidents at two other reactors at the Santa Susana facility in the 1960s. Today, the reactor buildings have been torn down and taken away, but years of cleanup work remain. Health effects on the surrounding communities have been difficult to study because of their large populations and the fact that many people have moved out of or into the area over the years. And Southern California's population continues to swell. People are living closer than ever to the site, which is now owned by Boeing. And because certain types of radiation released in the accident can remain at dangerously high levels for centuries, the decisions made at Santa Susana in the 1950s and 60s will continue to affect residents for generations to come. Of the three most prevalent radioactive elements identified at the Santa Susana site, cesium-137 has the longest half-life at 30 years. Dangerous amounts of it will remain there for about 300 years.